<clears throat> okay, so good evening, uh, everyone. Welcome uh, to our general council this evening of November the 8th. Uh, just before I begin uh, the um, our, agen our agenda and, and passing that, I want to take opportunity to have a moment of silence. Uh, as a uh, majority of our community probably knows, we had a longtime employee, Karen Bombery, pass away. Uh, and so really want to give an opportunity for us to um, just reflect and, uh, you know, look at all her contributions she's given us to our community. So I'm going to ask for our council just to uh, to have a moment of silence. Now, yeah, for that uh, council, and again, uh, sending our sincere condolences uh, and thoughts and prayers to uh, Karen's family and friends. Again, she's been a longtime employee uh, at our housing uh, department, uh, being the director for, for many years, uh, working uh, and contributing to our community in multiple uh, sectors within the housing uh, area. So I want to really uh, send our most heartfelt condolences uh, to uh, the family uh, and friends of, of, of Karen. Hazel? Yeah, Mark, I'm just in shock. I never heard that. And uh, I worked with Karen for so many years and I feel so sad and shocked to hear that. When did she pass away? I'm not sure on that. I just know uh, I had just seen the uh, obituary. Hmm. Yeah, so very, very shocking news, so sad. And to be honest, uh, there's so much uh, loss in the community. So I just want to also, you know, just to let community know that, you know, leadership is thinking of all of our families going through tough times right now. Losing loved ones is never, never easy. Oh. <clears throat> that's, that's hard to hear. Very shocking. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for that council. I'm going to, I'm going to now uh, begin and call the meeting back to order, uh, looking to first identifying any media on the line. And just while we're doing that as well, I just really quickly, as we all know, it's uh, Indigenous Veterans Day uh, today. So I want to recognize all of our veterans. Uh, I know obviously we've done our uh, our ceremony uh, a couple weeks ago at the Veterans Park, which is a beautiful ceremony uh, hosted by our Six Nations Veterans Association uh, annually. They, actually, was, this was the first year post uh, uh, post pandemic that they, we were able to actually have have a ceremony. So want to also recognize all of our uh, Indigenous veterans. Looking or seeing, uh, or rather seeing or uh, hearing no uh, representation from any media on the line, I'm going to call uh, looking to uh, any additions, deletions to the agenda. Okay, seeing or hearing none, then I'll look to a mover and seconder to adopt the general council agenda of November the 8th. Moved by Audrey, seconder, seconded by Sherry Lynn. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. So we do have our first delegation, or rather our only uh, delegation on the agenda this evening uh, is Jeff Thomas in relation to First Nations cable and internet verbal update. So if I could get Brooke, if I could get Jeff into the room, looks like he's connecting now. So good evening, Jeff. Hi, how are you? Uh, doing well, thank you. How are you? Very good. Good. Uh, I'm going to pass the floor right over to yourself, Jeff. I know we've been doing these regular updates for community to see what the status of the project is. So with that uh, uh, said, I'll pass the floor right over to yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I wish I could say we were a bearing to the houses, but, uh, you know, uh, the government still hasn't come through with the contracts yet. Uh, one thing we did find out that uh, um, the UBF or it's the grant organization, um, it's made up of both the feds and province. And we weren't aware of that. And uh, there's two contracts assigned. <laughs> so surprise, surprise, we had another contract that we got to put together with them. So that kind of delayed things, but uh, it's kind of a day by day thing right now. Um, they tell us uh, that it's, it's almost there and that they, asked me if I'd be interested in doing a press release, which was a good thing because that tells me that it's very close. So we, we hope this week we should hear something from them. But on the positive side of things, um, phase one has been completed. 
Phase one consists of the backbone that uh, we built from uh, Middleport back to the office here. Um, we now are live. Um, we've uh, started with 20, 20 gigabits. Um, our link is a 100 gigabit link. And uh, this is up and running now. So it's lit and um, we are, all of our fiber customers and our cable modem customers are seeing the changes now. So that's very exciting for us. Um, something that's uh, the, one of the key components to this whole project, getting this uh, backbone up and running. So we got that up and running. And uh, by the way, Ban will be on, uh, Dave's working on some, uh, with these contractors to do the connection probably within them three to four weeks, we should have you guys on as well. So that's good news from that perspective. Uh, wish I had better news for the actual bearing to the homes, but that's the next stage. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, we got fourth line all designed. Uh, we have a contractor ready to go. It's just a matter of waiting for a commitment from the government here. Okay, thanks, Jeff, for uh, for that update. Just really quickly, I have a couple questions. I know these uh, uh, inquiries have been coming in uh, through the chief's office in terms of boundary lines. So obviously, we know New Credit is already all hooked up uh, uh, with their fiber, uh, and community members are really um, they're really frustrated because they don't understand why just across the street they can't hook up to that. Uh, and so I reached out as well to uh, to Chief Laforme. Uh, to, uh, you know, have discussion. He was agreeable, but uh, it was, I think, come back that uh, Rogers, uh, uh, Rogers was stating uh, that they, uh, you know, were not uh, agreeable uh, just based upon the activity that happened or, or happened to their crews while on the territory. So wondering, is there opportunity to, like, I know there's things happening on, on the front that you just updated us, but in terms of boundary lines, and can we get, at least start, get those houses hooked up? Well, personally, I say no. Um, once you let Rogers in, they're going to come in here and try and take over. I mean, that's a fight we've already fought. But I but, will, not, I will not be part of that, Mark. Okay, so on that then, Jeff, where do we then leave our members who are frustrated? Well, they're no more frustrated than I am. I, I have no service at my place. No, very, I know, but very we, poor we, also don't have, we also don't have across the road fiber lines. <laughs> yeah. I don't have it at my place neither. So it's something that we're working towards, Mark. I, you know, it's going to be a three-year project. It's going to take time. I mean, there's going to be the ones I hook up first, and there's going to be the ones I hook up last. Right. I mean, I have no control of that portion of it. No, I, I understand that piece. My Our job is to get everybody hooked up as quickly as possible in partnership with yourself. I think that's what, you know, we are, are looking to. But in terms of exclusivity, I mean, I think it's still open too, right? It's not like you have full exclusivity uh, to the territory. Is that correct? I think that's what this question is all about, really, because at the end of the day, uh, I uh, we can only respond accordingly to what we know. And we're, we're trying to say, okay, hang on. Yes, let's get you hooked up on the boundary lines. If there's fiber across the street, it makes sense. We're neighboring communities uh, and there's a service that is uh, well needed we have to come up with ways to get it done more in a, in a more timely way. Okay, so now what happens with the people around the corner now? Does well, that mean you it. allow Rogers to come further into the system? I mean, that's defeating the whole freaking thing that I've put together for the last five years. I mean, but you, you got to be getting, as much as I am getting messages and frustration. I'm getting messages from New Credit. They don't like Rogers' service. They don't like the cost. They don't like the having to, to uh, do credit checks before they can hook up and all this other stuff I keep hearing. I mean, if I had my brothers, we would have been burying a long time ago. I lost a whole season here and that I can't get back. I mean, we would have had a third of the reserve done by now if it wasn't for the government dragging their feet. Well, where are those pieces? Because, I mean, you had mentioned in terms of contracts. I mean, is there anything politically that we can even further do? I mean, I've done, uh, I feel like I've done my part in terms of 
calling whoever, whenever to get. We any, all we all have done our part. No, I'm just saying in terms of further advocacy from the chief's office that we can push. Um, I do have some contacts. I don't. I can forward who we're dealing with. I don't know. I mean, I just the, the, the frustrating part is. Uh, don't get me wrong. We we're still in this. We've supported local businesses. That's what community wanted. That's what they want to hear. But they also are saying now at the same time, when is this going to happen? And I know we're getting these updates, and that's exactly what uh, you're updating us on. But the other part is we can. You still look to the you know the government to say, hang on here. Well, if this can happen in three months, right next door to us. Why is it taking three years for us to get it if it's based upon just capital funding? Well, the three years will be the time frame to build it. We figure we can do it in two, but that's what they slotted was three years. Right. But I'm saying, can we actually push the government to say, hang on here, like, let's get going. That's what I'm saying. Like, because at the end of the day, I can, I can sense everybody's frustration. We all want access to reliable internet. It's just a matter, and we want to support local while doing that. I mean, I think this council's made that very clear, but also in terms of the community, they want op options. And I think that's something that we need to also look at because at the end of the day, uh, you know, time is of an essence. I mean, that's something that we have to also look at. I see Audrey has her hand raised. Sorry, Audrey, you're on mute. Hazel had hers up first. Thanks for that. Sorry, I didn't see that. Hazel, and then over to Audrey. And Hazel, you may be on mute. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to ask a question to Jeff. Um, previously in another meeting, you had said that um, Fourth Line would be hooked up this fall. So since the government has not provided the necessary uh, things you need to hook us up, so once it comes and winter's now going to set in, so when the ground freezes, are you still able to lay that cable and still we're hook able, up? We're able to put pipe in on. The biggest thing is we can't uh, bury like our service wires. But see, there's a big commitment there. Like if the government doesn't come through on this thing, you know, I mean, uh, I just laid out $1.5 million to build this line into the reserve here. You know, I mean, I can only go so far with what I got. And uh, I lived up to my part. Mark's talking about everybody that's done their part. I mean, I've done my part big time. You know, we made a big commitment and we've been working on this a long time. And uh, until I can free up some cash to start getting these contractors in here. I mean, that's the whole issue right now. Hmm. We fully intend on having fourth line done by Christmas. I'll tell you that right now. Well, my, my question, uh, Jeff, was just that once it starts to freeze mm -hmm. and the ground is frozen, do you still um, lay the, the fiber optic line despite the weather conditions? We can lay the pipe. It's the service wires that we can't because the ground will freeze up. We can yeah. uh, use drills and drill the road, drill the uh, pit, the pit kind of thing. We can continue okay. on with that. That's not the problem. The problem will be uh, service wires and doing the actual hookup. Uh, oh, okay. We have to plow those in. They're only down maybe a foot or 18 inches or so like that. Mm -hmm. so once okay. the frost hits that, that's pretty, pretty tough. Okay, thank you. That Jeff, and just really quickly before I go to Audrey, I'm going to suggest Jeff, and again, this this is just us trying to help even further. You know, I know uh, the commitment that's that's been made. I'm going to call uh, our contacts and maybe get you into uh, the meeting, and all of us have uh, one sit down and say, "What's the holdup here?" Because right. our community is waiting, and I can't continue to say, "Ah, uh, you know." We're, we're doing, we're working, we're, you know, community members are getting frustrated. So I know we're all getting frustrated. We all want this done. So if we can focus, continue to focus on the common goal, I'm going to pull together a meeting with the, with the necessary people and yourself. And we're going to discuss this further in terms of expediting whatever. That'll you. help push it through. I mean, every time I call them, every time I talk to them, they, it's always give me more information. Give me this, give me that. And well, I think that's yeah, what I, I I'm gonna. I'll, I'll work with you off the line, Jeff, Tammy, and I, and we'll look to schedule this meeting as soon as possible. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, thanks for that, Audrey. 
Yeah, I believe that you're right, Chief, when you said that the community, 98% of them wanted to have a choice of service provider. So Jeff, how is that able to, to happen? If you lay all the fiber, does it belong to you? And then how are the other people able to, uh, I guess, rent it? What do you think? I'm just throwing uh, $1.5 million away here, Audrey. Do you realize how much money that is? I do. With a small company like we got, you know how hard that was to come up with that? Do you expect me to open the whole the just fiber to up to everybody? Just to clarify, if you receive the UFB funding, that's open source. We haven't received anything from them. That's the whole freaking problem. That's, but that's my point. It, once you receive funding from them, once we push and pressure as we're going to, that's going to be open source. So, Audrey, to answer your question, yes. yes. Thank you. That's what the community were asking for. You know. And that's based upon the actual funding criteria itself, if successful. Further questions, comments? Uh, Helen? Yeah, I think we really need to get on the government's behind and tell them to get moving on this. We're going to have to be really forceful. I don't know who who the government is that he's speaking of. I don't know who the contact people are, whether there's a minister or a deputy minister or what that runs this thing. It's but we need to get on their case. The, I mean, it's that's the people that put the contract together where the delay is. Well, we I need mean, the people as we knew, the bosses of those people is who we need to talk to. Yeah. Because, right, you're saying people are, everybody's complaining, but what is he supposed to do if he can't get the government to do what they're supposed to do? It's the government that's dragging their ass. And I'm going to say dragging their ass. That's who it is. It isn't Jeff. It's the government. So what are we going to do about it? Mark said he's getting a meeting. Well, that better be a real, we better be very aggressive in that meeting and let them know that we got to get this done because our people are complaining. Agreed. And to be Agreed. honest, we can't have like again, it, our 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 neighboring territory is already all hooked up. I mean, you could obviously even emphasize even further the frustration. So we're going to make a really obviously aggressive meeting uh, when uh, we schedule this, Jeff. So that's why I'm obviously it, they, they're giving Rogers the contract they're supposed to get. Why can't they give it to First Nations Cable? Right. And that's something that we're going to get to the end of the bottom. Of. Okay. And just to FYI, Rogers, the difference between that is Rogers was paying for it themselves. They weren't yes, going through any government funding. Yes. Uh, Sherry Lynn. Well, they can afford to do that. <laughs> exactly. Charge enough money for their damn rates. They can afford to do that. Well, either way, we're we're going to set a meeting and we're going to continue to push some pressure on because we want to get internet to all of our members as soon as possible. Sherry Lynn? Yeah, for sure. And I totally agree. I guess the part of it, I just need clarification. So the ones on, on the border, borders of the reserve, um, so they can't get hooked up. So is that what I'm understanding? So the ones that, that currently are, like, say, for the border lines of, of the credit, new, credit First Nation in our territory, those border lines, because there's fiber optics across the road from their homes, um, they, you know, New Credit has no problem. We actually, I had a very quick conversation in Toronto with Chief of Form on this matter, and uh, we were going to set up a further meeting, but the, 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 the part of it was that Rogers had an issue because of activity happened happened to the company and so that that is where it's it was it was drawn the line but obviously if the two first nations come together and, and want to maybe get our boundary line homes hooked up as quickly as possible i mean i think that's still an opportunity i think that we should be looking at all avenues to get everybody hooked up as quickly as possible and just to Jess' point, he's right. There's, there's going to be people who are going to be upset because some are going to get hooked up before others. It's no different than the water distribution lines. I mean, at the end of the day, the common goal is everybody is going to have internet. So we've got to focus on that. Further questions, comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, uh, Jeff, I'm going to work with Tammy to work with yourself and we're going to we're going to schedule this meeting and we're going to have a prep session beforehand and that way we'll go in in terms of where we need kind of a more aggressive approach. 
in the interim, I'll put together a list of the government people that I'm dealing with. Perfect. And uh, their contacts and all that. And okay, Tammy, uh, can you reach out tomorrow? Okay, Jeff, Tammy's going to reach out to you tomorrow. All right, very good. And we'll, and we'll go from there. Okay, thank you, Jeff, for the update. Can I get a motion, uh, Council, to uh, uh, look to the mover to accept the verbal update from Jeff Thomas, moved by Sherry Lynn, seconder. Second by Greg. Further questions, comments? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. We'll talk soon, Jeff. All right. Okay, good thanks. Have a good night. <clears throat> okay, Council, uh, the next I have on the agenda is Councillor reports uh, from both uh, Councillor, or rather just Councillor Helen Miller. So I'll pass the floor over to Helen if you want to walk through uh, some of your updates. She has both written and uh, I would assume uh, looking to verbal as well. Yeah, I'm trying to follow the new process, but I'm pretty confused. It's, um, it's to be honest, I think you did you did it phenomenal. So especially job. with the, I'm confused with the resolutions because I thought whoever was putting this on the agenda would do proper resolutions. I don't think I should be the one to be doing all these whereases and whereases and all that stuff. So I guess they didn't do that though. But anyway. My first one was the, uh, and I'm I'm hoping everybody read them because they have been on the Dropbox as far as I know. If you're not going to read them, there's no point in me writing them. <laughs> so anyway, the Chiefs Committee on Housing and Infrastructure, as you know, I've been sending out emails for quite a while on this issue that council needs to do something about um, ISC handing over care and control of housing to First Nations people, First Nations communities. Uh, we've been meeting for almost two years on this. Um, initially, the Chiefs Committee on how they actually, I found out about this just by chance. And I told Mark I wanted to sit there. Um, the Chiefs Committee on Housing, they held up six workshops on gathering information. I guess they're calling it an engagement process on housing. And then once that was done, they held a housing summit with a lot of First Nations all about housing. So that they got money from that, from ISC to do that. The Chiefs of Ontario did. So that's what we've been doing. Um, the last um, meeting we had, um, we were we had asked on uh, I don't know what the hell what the heck are they. OFNTNC, <laughs> Ontario First Nation Tex Technical Services Corporation. Is that what it is? Anyway, we they asked them to do an options paper for the takeover of housing. So that's what they did. I had I submitted the options paper and the different things to council for people to read, but I can run through the options real quickly. And this is where we need to have discussion. Council needs to have discussion because next week they're going to the Chiefs of Ontario are going to be voting on these options. So we need to have discussion on these options and which one that we would want. But I don't agree with any of the options. As a person that's been sitting there for two years, I don't agree with them. I want Six Nations to do its own housing authority to be on our own, or we could even, my, my thinking too is maybe, you know, have the Iroquois caucus come up with the housing authority, work with them like that. That could be something we could do. But anyway, the first option is centralized housing region, housing office. So that would be a big office. People would sit there, um, they would have supposed to be representative. The second option is a regional housing organization board of representatives model. And all the people would be rep, the different PTOs and the independents would be represented on this board. The third one is regional housing organization resources hub model, and it's almost similar. And under that option three, I think is where an individual community could develop a their own housing authority. And the option four is, uh, Regional Housing Organization Decentralized Approach. 
they're mainly all of them are about having this big board in place to, you know, control everything, I guess, almost like in Indian affairs itself. Option five is status quo, just to stay the way we are. So I, I, I know they're going to be voting on these, and I, I would hope when Chief Hill gets up to speak on this, and I hope he does, that he advocates for uh, six nations to do its own housing authority, that we're going to do our own housing authority, but then we have to do that. <laughs> um, I know when Ava, before when Chief, when Ava Hill was chief, she sat on the housing committee and they did a lot of work on it. And uh, I found a document called the Six Nations Housing Authority. So apparently I'm thinking that Ava had started promoting Six Nations to try and do their own housing authority. So I can distribute that document to council just to have a look at it. It's, it's a simple little document, but it was a start, I guess. Um, so we can look at doing that, but I, that, that would be, you know, having sat there all this time, that would be my recommendation because all of these options, it's going to be the South versus the, the North versus the South. That's what's going to happen. And you know, the North has more votes than we do. So we, we don't only have one little vote sitting there. And I think the South is really going to suffer from this care and con transfer of care and control of housing because you know even now a lot of the housing money goes up to the north because they you know they really desperately needed housing well we are too but so this is what that's about i had wanted chris hoyos the communications director at chiefs of ontario he's the one leading the uh, the committee like he's the one arranges all the meetings to come and talk to council about these different options um, I know he met with Mark and talked to Mark about the different things. So the concern that I have, as I said, they're going to vote on these next week at the Chiefs of Assembly. Well, this, we need to speak up strongly as to what, what we want. I'm recommending that Chief Hill says we want to do our own. That's what I'm, I'm recommending. I don't, I don't yeah, know. Call I Sorry, uh, thanks for that, Helen, for providing uh, this written report, and, and I totally agree with you, uh, and that was actually uh, the same sentiments that we had um, communicated with our meeting with Chris. In fact, we just reached out uh, to his off or to the Chiefs of Ontario to have Chris come in on our political liaison on Monday, so that gives us an opportunity again to further ask questions. Um, I, too, agree with your recommendation. None of those, uh, none of those, um, none of those recommendations fit us. No, that's, that's something that I made very clear to him. And actually, he was already under the kind of impression that Six Nations would be doing our own because we're well, we're, I've been saying that. Yeah. And, and that was and that to be honest, I think that's good because we are a lot further than other First Nations. I mean, I think a lot of them even heavily rely on technical services. Right. Whereas we don't even really rely on, on tech services that, you know, as much as other First Nations. So I think that's something where we are at an advantage in a sense but we can obviously still do more. I wanted to touch base even with Darren uh, to see, and I know this was all, this will be forthcoming in terms of our infrastructure plan, our housing strategy and those pieces, because I wanna see where that fits in, in terms of, uh, you know, trying to get things like shovel ready by spring. If we could start on something even, uh, you know, if a, a, an apartment a duplex, whatever that looks like. And so that's something that we're, uh, also uh, discussing as well, but to your point on the on the governance side, I do agree with your recommendations. I think we're on the same page there, and um, I think that's something that we can further explore. And I, and, and as Chris was, uh, you know, he had just reached out, uh, um, you know, just again via via his role. But I told him again, like you know, Six Nations is going to continue to do what Six Nations will do. So right. regardless of of what you're doing on your engagements. Go, you do your due diligence, but here's what we're doing. And so that's something that I think is uh, the same message that you've been saying all along. Uh, Sherry, yeah, I haven't, been, I haven't been telling them we're going to do it, but I'm, I've been saying to them that the possibility is we likely will want to do our own. Exactly. Say, and same messaging as well from, from myself. Uh, Sherry Lynn. 
I guess, I guess the part of it is, is again, here the government is, is just giving us options and telling us, you know, pick A, B, C, D or whatever. And I guess it's, I understand that we are six nations, we're going to do our own and, and we should. And they should know that, you know, here's our plan and this is what's going to happen and this is how we're going to do it. But I think chief, when you speak, um, it's really stressing to the chiefs is uh, what are, what, what our plan to tell the government, all the chiefs sitting around there, what's your plan and tell the government what you want instead of these options that they think they're keep doing for years and years and that we're just gonna say, oh, we're gonna pick this option. That needs to stop. And they, they need to sit there and come together and really understand that what, it, what do they want and tell the government what they want instead of these options. Like, and that just makes us all stronger for, for everybody in, in this. So again, I totally agree with Helen's um, uh, resolution that we do our own, but also too, again, we need to stand together and, these, and the, chief, the rest of the chiefs at this um, assembly uh, chief need to understand that what are they gonna put on the table instead of these options that help them. I think that's a good point. And you know, Sherilyn, you also highlight a good point in terms of engagement. I mean, it, what I dislike is when the government gives engagement dollars to the Chiefs of Ontario, and it's basically just doing their dirty work in a sense. Uh, and I don't, I, I maybe I'm, I don't want to misconstrue my comments, but that's the frustrating part as well is why do we have to go and say just because government is now finally willing to look at, oh, we should have our own control and you know, have the responsibility over housing. And uh, in fact, we're seeing it in different sectors as well now, health, education, whatever. But I think that's where it also frustrates me because it's not a one-stop shop, but that's what Chiefs of Ontario is proving to be by continuing to do this type of work, in my opinion. Well, yeah, that's what it is. The, the Chiefs of Ontario is doing the government's work and they're calling it, the government's calling it First Nations-led engagement. Exactly. That's their new word now. You know, I, but just to make it clear to Sherry Lynn, this is not the government's options. These are the options from the Chief's Committee on Housing and Infrastructure, the right. committee okay. I sit on. They're okay. the ones who want these options, but there's a lot of chiefs that want to do this. They want to take care and control of housing, but I don't think they realize the consequences of, because you're going to have care and control of housing. You're going to have all the things to do about housing and what you can do, but it's still going to control the money. And that's the big concern I have. Exactly. They're still going to tro control the money. Right. But people see this money and, you know, they're offering, I don't know how much money they're offering. Uh, Chief, billions can I have of dollars. So just to follow a lot up. of reserves want to do this, but I think Southern Ontario is going to suffer from it myself all the different First Nations are gonna hurt by it because it's gonna be a lot of it's gonna be going up north, I think. Yeah, and that's that's always the unfortunate piece as well. I mean, I, I know and even Nathan could probably allude to this, but we all can, it's always been north versus south in a sense, and it's always the yeah. south losing in a sense. You know, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to argue or, you know, uh, look at different, like the different actual perspectives of that when we know we all have a need. It's not like it's it's like whose need is greater to then get the funding, and that's the, the like it's almost that divide and conquer yet again. So I think those are those are things that we need to also look at in terms of the way, uh, you know, even that like I said, the, even with the way Chase of Ontario is is um, is doing this type of engagement work. I that's know. A, yeah, that's that's a frustrating yeah, yeah. but I agree with you as well. The funding piece is is that's the biggest part. If ISK wants to give responsibility, well then give it fully. <laughs> not piecemeal it. Sherry Lynn, follow up and then over to Nathan. Well, yeah, just a follow up in the sense of we need like it's transitional, transitional housing because this is just one piece, but the overall, meaning the discharge from hospitals and the need of different cares that, that come back to the community. You know what I mean? They need housing. So this is bigger than just somebody's house. This is all the... Um, when the community members come back from certain situations that they're dealing with. So it's a bigger than I think what um, these options are or, or the plan is. And I think to your, uh, again, to that point, I think that gives us the ability to strategize further of the bigger picture 
of housing as opposed to what you're saying, just, you know, a house. Well, for- the, the chief's committee, we, they've done a lot of data and everything. We came up with a figure of to, to get Ontario caught up on housing, in, including new houses and and different things like that, surveys and all that stuff and renovations and repairs. We need $4.5 billion. Last year, it spent 56 million on housing in Ontario. And our figure is we need 4.5 billion to catch, just to catch up. So there's a good big, big discrepancy there in the, in the, um, what we need for housing. It, it's, and that's just on reserve. That's not, that's not, that's not called the urban. Right. So there's a big, uh, big gap there. Agreed. Thanks. Uh, and we'll, we'll look to further strategize in our, hopefully our discussion on Monday with Chris. Uh, Nathan. Yeah, thanks, Chief, and, and thanks, Helen, for the report. <laughs> All good. Thanks, uh, Helen, for the report. Um, a couple of things. In 2012, there was a massive housing meeting in Ontario. And at that time, the BC model was, was proposed. Um, and by BC, I mean BC First Nations housing model was proposed, where a lot of those options that the Chiefs Committee now is working through, that's where they came from. So they they actually did come from government because government's trying to make Ontario BC. Um, so I remember that meeting in 2012. And yeah, you're, you're right. A lot of the regions just bought right into what ISK was selling. They drank the Kool-Aid. And I remember, um, would have been Ava, I think she was a counselor at the time, was very strongly against uh, a lot of this and, and put up that guard. And, and I see it continuing, and I agree with Helen and and, um, and Sherry Lynn on, on where we should go with this particular strategy. The one thing I'm going to offer is um, I think we need to, if, if we're going to uh, work on, I guess we would defeat the resolution, try to anyway, uh, if not oppose it. But I think we have to do some work with Chiefs of Ontario around the funding for consultation. I still have a problem with the amount of money that we don't get to do this particular work that this regional organization now has taken. You know, I can proudly say for 15 years, Chiefs of Ontario never took that money and it it went direct back into the communities. Um, But now they are taking the consultation money and I think that's the broader issue is somewhere, somehow, somebody feels they have the authority without a resolution to consult on behalf of First Nations. That is a huge no-no. And do, uh, do we think that the Chiefs really understand what they're doing? I don't think so. Because I, I would say they, they're not necessarily forthcoming on their, um, basically what they did is they gave the government an out and they're, consulting on behalf of the government now on a lot of things. I think that's the broader issue is, is right. that. And uh, for, for me, I think everything that Helen and, and Sherry Lynn said, yes, but also we have to do some work on getting that cons- those consultation dollars back in our community so that we can do the work to develop the, the housing authority as, as right. Helen's suggesting. Exactly. And just really quickly, the other part, and I know Helen may touch on this in her next uh, report in the ATR process. I mean, when you look at not only just the funding allocation, but the time frame allotted, I mean, uh, that's the other piece. It's, uh, 20, by 2025, we might have a new ATR process. Well, who's to say the government's going to even been, be in office at that time? Like, So there's just certain things I think that we also need to look into and take into consideration. Uh, Darren? Uh, thank, thanks, and thanks, Helen. Um, so I just wanted to offer my support for the conversation the way it's going. Uh, housing Authority, I mean, how we package that and how we run that is is completely up to us. And I think we have a, a big advantage, and I think we, we all sometimes overlook it, is that, you know, Six Nations has economies of scale. Uh, we have a we have successful uh, housing loan program, and we have a lot of members living off the reserve. So if you recall, we finished a needs assessment about two months ago now. And within there is a lot of strategy around an authority, uh, setting that up, how it could work, how it could be viable, how it could make money to come back into the community. The, the important thing is, and I agree with Nathan, what Nathan's saying, it's not, there's not just the money that comes through, it's the bit dribs and drabs for housing. 
but it's the consultation dollars as well to help assist with that. So that's a lot of advocacy that's needed. Um, but at the same time, we're at the ready to do, as, as Chief has noted, we, we've got uh, uh, evidence to support putting in proposals to do apartment complexes, to do more building, to more transitional housing. It's all, it's all there uh, laid out for us in that needs assessment. So we have evidence-based approach to do this authority. I mean, it's amazing what we can do. We just need to allow, give ourselves permission to do it and just be sovereign and do it. So I just, I'm just right. gonna right. stop. But I think that that's, that's, that's what we need to do. There's a lot of advocacy there, but we've got the numbers, we've got the ability to do it. We've got a business plan to do it. Amazing, I agree. I totally agree. Thank you, Darren. Hazel. Yeah, and, and listening to all of this, I think our council needs to, um, we talk about sovereignty, and then it seemed like we spend a lot of time discussing what the government is going to do, and uh, we say we're going to do it ourselves. I think we need to take a firm stand and 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 do it ourselves by setting up a our own. Um, where did I write it down here? Six Nations um, governance and everything that falls under there would be. For, Six Nations, First Nations Housing Authority, Six Nations, First Nations Education Authority, and the same all the way down with health and all of that. And if you recall, Phil Mentor has expressed it many times to think ahead how you want your department, what you want to do, because we're closer than ever in going to court with regard to those land claims. So if everybody moved in that direction to let your, let your ideas flow, like how would you like to see it? What does that housing authority look like? It should contain everything that's needed for whatever situation. I think it, it's tiring when you hear ISK. They've always got their finger in the door and that's all they want to have and they want somebody else to do it all but the big thing is they want to hang on to your money and it reminds it reminds me that they treat us like we're irresponsible people who don't know how to spend your own money they don't even want to give you your money so i'm thinking that this council needs to develop their own governance plan based on that that um land claims and what Phil Mentor has told everybody to do and have a plan, an action plan. As soon as that court, uh, the claims go through the court, that everybody's ready and uh, ready to go with their, their new advanced plan over and above what Chiefs of Ontario, the AFN or anybody, they won't be able to touch it because you'll have it all compact right here at home so to me that's what we should be aiming to do as far as being using that word sovereign if we're going to do that let's do it and quit just um adhering to little bits and pieces that isk tells you to do it, it's to me i find it very frustrating with them and each time that something is needed they piecemeal you little bit of money here. Like I know um, when Mike Mentor was trying to get funding to put in the water lines, like the whole reserve needs water. And I know that Indian Affairs knows that. They know our water situation, but what do they do? They'll probably give you 10 cents and they want you to do big things with 10 cents. So I get kind of hyper when I talk about stuff like this because that's what I'm thinking is beyond what it is today. And when those land claim dollars start flowing and if everybody's got that plan in place like Phil has asked everybody to do, we'll be ready to roll with with the best. Thank you. Well, I can, uh, you're bang on Hazel with your comments. I can understand why you get hyped up. You're hyping me up because it's worse you know it's we're sick of these band-aid solutions i'm sick of ottawa and isk thinking they know our people best uh yeah. you know i think we know our people and we know our issues and needs 
better than anybody. And so I think, you know, that's where we often get caught to say, well, what are we doing about it? What are we doing when we're actually doing a lot, but it doesn't seem like that. So I think that's where, you know, your comments are like, to hell with uh, waiting for them. Let's just do what we got to do. That's right. Appreciate right. your comments. Uh, Nathan? Sorry, over to you, Nathan. I think Audrey was ahead of me. Oh, I, I'm so sorry. I'm not flipping the screen. I apologize, Audrey. Audrey first and then back over to Nate. Oh, Audrey, you're on mute. I just love saying that. I know you do. <laughs> I agree with my colleagues. <clears throat> it's, it's, um, it seems to me that the big picture is what we have to be working on. We have all these little programs. We all we have all this thing everybody's working on, but we got to put it under one main umbrella. We have to keep bringing it forward to our council on a regular basis. We can't lose sight of anything from education right down to public works to everything that we've worked on. Because I think we all should be experts on each of these so that when we talk about housing, everybody knows and is up to date on housing, our plan for it. Uh, what's the expansion plan on it? How do we make it easier for homeowners to be able to uh, afford a house? Do we have rental properties that we can, we can uh, turn a house into or build something for them? So all of that has to be done. And I'm sure a lot of it is done, but we need to let everybody know what's being done. And I, I, I keep advocating that we have to let the community know all the good things that are being done by this council. We have lifelong learning, which has been going on for, since I was first here, 2016, 2017. We asked for the money from ISC and we were able to get our money to do our own engagement with the community on education. So they do have your money and they do have it portioned out of how much you get for each reserve. So I think that's what we have to make sure we know that what that formula is and get it for everything because they're not gonna offer it. As they say, I also sent out everybody an email today and it has to deal with, with the education and um, they wanted, Chiefs of Ontario want to be our uh, communication as well as our engagement people for um, language and for education. And I don't believe we should be doing that. No. We have our own right and we have our own way of doing things. And I think that we have to send a very polite note back saying, thank you, but no thank you. So I'll bring that up after. And um, I just think that working together is so important now. It's, you know, that letter we had from uh, Minister Hedu, it, it basically says it right there. They're getting ready for you to transfer everything to us. And we have to be ready for it to fit into our big plan. But they don't get to shove it at us. We get to put it in the plan we decide. And with that, we need communication with our community as well as all of our departments. Um, thank you. Yeah, well. yeah, I agree, Audrey. And just to also add to your point is we decide when as well. You know, when if we're not going, we're not going to set ourselves up for failure. So I think that's the other piece uh, you know, to uh, to your points as well as the importance of working collaboratively as best as we can to the bigger picture. Nathan. Yeah, I agree, and I think one of the um, one of the things we should consider as as we develop and and scope out this particular piece again is thinking about what our relationship ought to be with ISK. What is our relationship with the government? Um, because I think it's important to start defining that and, and get away from this ISK defining things for us. I, I keep going back to this, but there is a master plan and ISK is driving towards something. And, and what it is, is control. They mask things and it's it's sheep's and wolves clothing, this transformative change, um, you know, the, the stuff they're doing in, in health, the stuff they're doing in, in, um, in, in housing, all the way to social services. And it really, really bothers me because other First Nation, everybody, if you go to the Chiefs of Ontario, everybody's bought in and, and it's, it's right. sickening. That's why I don't go to those forums anymore. 
um, you know, it's it's sickening to watch everybody buy into, you know, what used to be Ann Scotton's plan, which is probably going to become Mike's plan. And there's no avenues being created. And, and what's disappointing is I would like a partner and I like Helen's idea about working with the, the Iroquois caucus, because I think we need partners. Uh, to do this work, like-minded First Nations, but I'm not finding any other outside of the um, the Iroquois caucus that we can work with. I'm sorry to say it. Are we in public? Is this open forum? But there's a bunch of 132 conformists out there, from my perspective. It's not 132 First Nations. It's 132 conformists that are conforming to what IS wants them to do. Right. And I don't want to be down that path. Anyway, I agree with everything Nathan said. I hate Thank sitting there and hearing this, but I got to be there to keep an eye on things. Yeah, and we definitely appreciate you being there, uh, Helen, and bringing this forward. I do have Melba, who has her hand raised uh, as well for some comments. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, when um, <clears throat> Nathan came back home, he made it clear that uh, these processes that AFN and KU are, are really unfair, is my words now, no justice for our needs. That was very clear. And here we are again discussing housing. And you know, everyone knows we have an aging population and the needs are greater when you're getting older. Just recently, I'm sure Joe, our person that is uh, dealing with complaints, has uh, been in touch with elders. For example, walk-in bathrooms, walk-in tubs. Where do we get the money for that? How many of our people that need that can have that? Or are we going to wait for them to be hospitalized and fall? So that's what's happening here. I think we, we really need to, as you're saying, we speak for ourselves. You said that yesterday, Mark, in a meeting when I mentioned the ministry and it wasn't meant for the ministry to come down and tell us our needs. It was meant for we to tell them our needs when it comes to other areas of care, for example, the elderly and, and, and children. And I think it, um, it certainly goes beyond uh, housing the needs that we're talking about here in respect to children. That is why we do not have a lot of foster homes because of the standards that's required by legislation. When are we gonna decide the standards? When are we gonna decide when our children can, can sleep with their brother and sister when they're young children? So, I really, I really get concerned about this because it's, it's, um, it affects a lot of situations here on the reserve. So I'm glad we're having this discussion and uh, we're going to get tough. We're going to get tough and telling what our needs are. Like Mark has said, you're not going to tell us anymore what our needs are. We know what our needs are when it comes to housing and social and health. And we know. They can come down and, and certainly hear what we got to say, but we are going to tell them the way things are here. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Melba. And I agree. And just, just to also uh, add further, as much as we're going to tell them, we also have the solutions. That's part of the problem. You know, when we look at our territory, our members, the amount of expertise and experience across the board in different sectors, we have it right within our own community here. We have the solutions. And I think that's something that we're also going to start to further, you know, heavily rely on in terms of collaboration and making sure our community comes along with us. Sherry Lynn. Um, next week, Chief, when this comes up, um, in your statement or in when you oppose it <laughs> or whatever, I think with um with a, the talks that are that we're having our concerns and everything. Um, I hope that you, you say all these things. Um, who cares if they're all gonna, like, <laughs> like um, Nathan said, if they're all in agreement, but we're not and, and reasons why we're not. And, you know, like just everything that we've talked about tonight, 
I would like that on the floor for all them chiefs to hear. Amazing. Totally agree. Sounds good. Yes. So Helen, uh, what we'll do then in terms of uh, decision points, maybe for now we could accept your written uh, and verbal report on this matter uh, and then look to our next uh, political liaison as Chris is confirming uh, that he'll be in attendance to uh, walk us through the presentation. All right, sounds good. Okay, so that being said- Okay, I'll look on to my next one is addition to reserve. Sorry, Helen, just really quickly, I'm gonna go for a mover and call for a mover and oh, second. Oh, sorry. The verbal and written report from Helen on housing. Moved by Sherry um, Lynn. Seconder, seconded by Audrey. Any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing that motion is carried. Thanks, Helen, back over to you. Okay, during discussions in our housing meeting, I come to find out that the ISC and CERDAC, which is uh, Indigenous Services Canada, is responsible for the backlog of the added to reserve lands. Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada, CERNAC, as Mark Miller, is responsible for the policy. So just to make that clear, um, I come to find out that they were reviewing the ATR policy issues. Now, they've been talking about reviewing the ATR for years and years, but they're actually doing it now. And what's concerning to me is because we never really heard too much about this. Um, I, I never seen it on any of the agendas, like for the, the, the coup or the last agendas they had, I never seen anything on the agenda like that. So I'm a little bit concerned as to this coming through when we didn't really know nothing. Um, so what's happening now is um, they got, we, I found out that ISK and CERNAC, I don't know which one it was. I think it was ISK. <laughs> they got about $43 million they got to re review the ATR process and to supposedly catch up on the backlog of ATR lands. There's 1,300 lands waiting to get added to the reserve in Ontario. So they were supposed to use this money to do community engagement and to try and get rid of the backlog. But I don't think they're working too much on the backlog. So the first step was for to them for them to start re revamping the um, first step is for them was to focus on how engagement would work. Um, there's supposed to be money for First Nations to do community engagements. Again, like Nathan said, they're putting it on to First Nations to do the engagement so they can say it's First Nations led. Um, we could hire somebody if we wanted to work on it. There's supposed to be money for that. And then um, they're going to, I think in 2025, they're going to take everything to cabinet. So, but I come to find out that they've already started into the process of engaging. They've engaged with quite a few First Nations organizations. There's a whole list. And I was quite surprised when I seen the First Nations Tax Commission on that list. I couldn't imagine what they were engaging with the First Nations Tax Commission for. Um, they've also engaged with a lot of council, I mean, uh, government departments already. So they're pretty much in, in they're pretty much going into the end of the first year. So Chris Hoy, Chris from Chris Hoyos from um Cool again had recommended that if we want it, we were going to engage our community, we should do it before the end of the year. But really, there's not a whole lot of, um, I guess, information around what we're going to engage with our community. It's kind of, it's kind of, uh, what do you call it? I don't know. <laughs> um, so that, and then, um, Chief, the AFN is heavily involved in this ATR process. And I'm going to, I'm doing, a, I'm just talking about this briefly now, but I've written a report for the Indigenous Services uh, joint gathering we had 
two weeks ago, and, I, and I've got a more comprehensive report in there about the ATR, because they talked about it there. So I'm just letting everybody know this is what's happening now. They're doing it. They're starting it. It's going ahead. The AFN is heavily involved in this. Um, and one of the chiefs on our committee questioned what the AFN was doing and getting involved in our community lands when it's not their land. So, so I, I'm going to fill in more on that when I do do my report next week. I think I think Brooke put it on a political laser Monday, I think. So there's more in there. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's it's concerning because we haven't uh, we uh, nobody even nobody on my committee knew about it. On my housing committee, the chiefs on the housing committee, they didn't know about it either. So I don't know what's going on, why nobody seems to know about it. I talked to Lonnie and he hadn't he didn't uh hadn't heard about the recent one either. Just that, you know, they've been doing it for years and years, but they're up there now and they're doing legislation on it because it's supposed to go to cabinet in 2025. My my recommendation would be. We should be telling them this is our, this is how we want our, we don't want the ATR process. We want return the land process. That's what I think we should be saying. Return the land to us, never mind adding it to reserve, return the land to us with the way you took it. Similar to what the, I guess the ACC had sit back in when it came to the birch line. Um, and I wondered again, if we couldn't make a, partnership with the Iroquois Caucus to come up with a separate, different kind of an ATR process, separate from government. I think it's something worthy of looking at. I don't know if it's even feasible, but I think it's something that we could look at because we should be, you know, add it to reserve. I don't know. It's our land. <laughs> Yeah. It's ours. Just, just if I could, uh, just to start off with some comments, uh, and I do, uh, I feel the same sentiments again as you, Helen. Part of the frustration for me again is when we talk to say for Hazel's previous comments of, uh, you know, just we got to just do what we got to do. I'm like, I'm sick of just waiting. If we have property in the ATR, which we know we do, I think there's roughly, I think, and Lonnie emailed us the total acreage in the ATR process right now. I'm like, there are properties where we should just do whatever the hell we want to do there. If it, it's to right. meet the needs of our community, I'm not going to wait 20 more years to get an ATR land through that. Like, that's ridiculous. So I think that's where we also can get even more tough to say, regardless of what, if it's in any process, it's our land, we're going to do whatever the hell we want <laughs> based upon our needs. And I think that's something that we have to get start to shift the mentality on this. In regards to the Iroquois caucus, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a common theme here, and I think I'm, I'm really happy to see the growth of, uh, of, the, of, of the Iroquois caucus. So, uh, and I know um, uh, Melba and, and Hazel can, can attest to, we've been uh, you know, really moving on some items, and I think it's been a good process, as well, especially the fact that there is now uh, an opportunity for just grand chief and chief to discuss political priority issues, and then on the other side, have the technician side to really do the due diligence work, bring that back to the chief's table so that we, we've kind of structured that in that way so that we can, you know, stay focused in on issues and that they don't go to the wayside. So that's something that I think we can also continue to bring in housing, ATR, all these items um, to the Iroquois caucus to start to discuss further because the other, uh, I think, um, beauty of the Iroquois caucus is we're, we're very similar to those uh, to our sister communities uh, you know when it comes to the issues and so I think that's something to know uh, you know that we have um, support back and forth or vice versa to say you know you had issues over here here's what we did and here's what some of our successes and challenges were you know so I think that's something that we could also look to further discuss and heighten these um, you know topics. Yeah I don't know what the AFN is doing but there's very little information on this. I mean, they say we're supposed to engage with our community, but what are we engaging about? 
Exactly. If they're re if they're changing the ATR process, what are they changing? We haven't seen anything as to what the the AFN's got like three committees, three three different things working on this, and I'll bring that up next week. But my question, when they keep saying for us to, oh, you got money to engage with your community, what are we engaging our community with? Like, because we have no information as to what they're doing. I don't know what they're changing. I don't. I don't know either, to be honest. And, I, and Nathan could probably allude further to that to the fact. Yeah, that it's, 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 there's very little information coming on it. But yeah, I wish and, that could be going to the AFN in December, but I won't be able to because I would want to hear what they're all saying. But I can do more on that next week with all the different committees they have going. Okay, and maybe then we, we can get start getting information from them. When also too, when we get uh, the confirmation from Chris uh, Hewell from Chiefs of Ontario, perhaps we could even add this discussion on uh, after the uh, housing right. discussion for Monday's political liaison, just the FYI. But to be honest, I think yeah. this even further gets to the fr frustration of the AFN in general. Like, I don't know what's going on, but the national chief uh, seems to be going and visiting and doing everything in other communities, but the work that needs to be happening. So I don't know, I, I'm losing faith. I've lost faith in the AFN for many, many years, continue to lose faith. And that's just my own personal opinion. Uh, Greg? Uh, yes, chief, I kind of uh, agree with everything that's been said so far. I. I attended that uh, that is gathering too as well with Helen, and <clears throat> I can um, attest uh, to exactly what uh, what she had uh, what she had basically heard and what she's saying. Um, I attended an, an uh, Department of Indian Affairs meeting about I think back in the '90s, and their activities towards uh, trying to find uh, ways to study models to examine, uh, ways to transform. It just goes on and on and on. And they do, they, they move, they do not move fast on anything. And it's, and it's always like 2025, they're, they're thinking of putting it towards the legislature. And then what? And we got to wait again for another decision. Like, I, I, I agree. I, I tried to, to back out of this uh, meeting next week, but now uh, after hearing what everybody said, and is I, and if I get my issues here from this council, I'm going to go and push forward uh, next week, and and because they seem to be led by a leash, rather than their chiefs, they should be leading. And um, anyway, that was just a, I just had to get that off my chest too. So, so thank you. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thanks for that, Greg. And we'll definitely need some more. Uh... Some more pushing so we'll definitely love to see uh see you attend yeah. as well because there's there's just so many issues that you know only one uh you know um, a team uh, approach is definitely the way i'm thinking uh nathan yeah thanks chief I'll, I'll just offer in terms of i know you talked about getting chris to do the adr update and i think he'll have some information um but my understanding is there is a series of secret meetings happening at AFN 2008 on for this particular initiative. Um, it might be advantageous to reach out to Kathleen Lickers to get the update because I think we'll get it more freely if we go that route. My understanding, she does probably signed an NDA, but there is still likely some information she can share with us to enlighten us on, on exactly what it is they were doing. And the reason why it's so secret, like I, I wanna know, like I'm a little worried because it, these are secret meetings and, and they're very blatant about being the secret meetings. I, I think we should find somebody that was in those secret meetings to give us the information. Because if we ask AFN, hey, we know he had some secret meetings, can you give us the information? I don't think they're going to be forthright. I can tell you that uh, in my report next week, there's lots of talk about the First Nations Land Management Act. And there's lots of talk about First Nations doing land codes. And I think it's all, if you really look at everything I'm going to talk about next week, it's all connected to all of this. A lot of it's connecting to the ATR. Is out there connecting, 
And I'm almost afraid that is there what's is this new this new ATR process may say that if you don't sign up to the First Nations Land Management Act and do a land code, you might not be able to add land to the reserve. That's how I see it going. I don't know for sure, but that's just what I'm thinking because they keep bringing it. When she talked about this at the, the ISK gathering, she kept talking about the First Nations land management and land codes. So I think they're all connected to somehow. There's something going on, I think, with our land. So, yeah, I I agree with this. Is, to me, this is a really big issue, and I'm I'm really, I'm I'm like Nathan. I'm sitting there at these meetings, and I'm thinking, why are the chiefs not saying anything? Like, why are they just sitting there and <laughs> letting all this stuff happen? Why are they not saying something? But it's like they just sit there. They, <laughs> well, they got lots of money to consult with their people. Well, <laughs> what are you consulting for? I don't know what we're consulting about. Yeah. Good point. So that's that one. I'm, I'll do more next week. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Helen. Uh, and I did make a recommendation for this because next week I was I was going to do it again next week. Okay, thanks. Um, Greg, uh, did you have your hand up or is that still up from the last time? Oh, okay. Uh, okay, Helen, well, thank you so much. And again, I, I know the staff here at the chief, uh, in the chief's office didn't want to... Uh, to uh, mess with your reports, but in terms of the whereas and stuff, but they will do that and put it in the proper format. Uh, they just want okay. To the the next one is real short. First Nations Delivery Credit Working Group. If you remember back in a few years ago, I think it was uh, two thousand and what I don't know sixteen or something when Ava was the chief. They got. They were. She was really instrumental in getting the Ontario Hydro to get rid of the delivery to and from charge on our hydro bills living for us living on reserve. She had. She was really big on working on that and was a committee and everything. Well, now I guess back in the day, the idea was that they would only do on reserve residents, and then later on they were going to look at band owned buildings. So in July, they started the committee back up and they want to look at band owned buildings getting the delivery to and from off of the hydro bills. So we met with Minister of Energy Todd Smith um, to find out if, you know, if there was openness and willingness and everything to do this. And, and um, going back to what the original thing was that they were going to talk about it down the road so we met with him um i wasn't too pleased with him i you know i felt like saying something to him but i never um anyway we talked about everything and then uh he started he kept pushing a program called um, conser conservation and demand management. Every time we talked about trying to get the delivery charges off, he'd bring up this program, cons con conservation and demand management. So what we, what I come to conclude is, well, President Ford, I mean, Premier Ford, as you know, um, doesn't want to get into building more generating stations because he says it's too expensive. So he's really, really big on conserving energy. He wants everybody to conserve energy. That's how he's going to save all kinds of money. So that's what this program is about. It's about conserving energy. So Minister Smith just kept pushing that. Every time we said something, he'd push that program and push that program. And um, it's basically... Uh, like I said, get new windows, doors, insulation, all that kind of stuff, and you're going to save lots of money on energy. So that's what he kept pushing at our committee. But then I come to find out, too, that this conservation and demand management program is now open to First Nations, or is now open to individual low-income people. It's open to First Nations. 
individually or whatever, you know, not just council. It's open to um, commercial, institutional, and industrial consumers, whether they live off or on reserve. So according to him and his his um, deputy minister, whatever his name is, Don, his name is Donovan, he said that First Nations delivery credit would only save 10 to 15% on energy costs. Well, the CDM would save up to 35%. So that's what they're pushing. He didn't say no to removing the delivery to and from off of band owned buildings. He never said no, but he said he would have to talk to Minister Rickford about it because it's a change from the legislation that was made. They would have to change the legislation, I guess, to include that. I, I use an example as to what I saw in our community and I used the arena as an example. I told him that because incidentally too, the hydro rates are going to go up big time in the new year. Um, they're gonna be quite high. So I used the example of the arena, I said, if the hydro rates are gonna go up high, the delivery charge is gonna go up higher. Uh, our arena is gonna to have to charge more money for the ice time. And then the minor hockey is going to have to charge more. And they're, so they're going to have to charge minor hockey more for the ice time. Minor hockey is going to charge us more for the registration to cover the extra cost. And there's going to be a lot of children that aren't going to be able to, uh, a lot of parents that aren't going to be able to afford that. So there's going to be a lot of kids that won't be able to play hockey. I said, that's one of the impacts to us, our community, I said, and I said that. You know, our o &M dollars are always insufficient, you know, and if we could get the delivery charges removed, it would make a lot of diff big difference on our o &M costs and could maybe use, you know, do better things with the money. But he just kept pushing that program, that CD and CDM program. So I called um, Crystal, I called um, Cheryl Henhock, I, I mean, I emailed Cheryl Henhock and asked her if she heard about this program because if it's supplying on reserve and everything, it sounds similar to, it's almost similar to that RAT program. Only thing is you don't have to, it's free. You don't have to pay it back. You don't have to pay any money toward it. You get your building assessed for what it needs and then you submit a proposal to get the money for it. So it's similar to, the way it sounds to that RAP program, only I think you can get, you can use, like you said, commercial buildings and band owned buildings, commercial buildings, not just for homeowners. So I, Cheryl didn't, hadn't heard about it. I called, uh, talked, uh, emailed Lily over at housing and she heard about the program. And she said housing was gonna be doing a project, I think in the new year on with that program. So she knew about it. Cheryl didn't know about it. So Cheryl told me to call Crystal Campbell, community en energy champion at Public Works. I didn't know we had a community energy champion at Public Works. So I called her and she, she hadn't heard of it either. She confused it with another energy program. So then I'm thinking, well, if it can apply to, you know, commercial peoples and, and, and apply to homeowners, why are we not letting their community know about it so that they can use it too? Um, so I thought it would be a good idea if Lily and Crystal did a community information session on these different, all these different energy programs or, or programs that can help people fix up their houses because we've never done that. As far as the actual um, delivery charge issue. Minister Smith said he would talk to his colleague, Minister Rickford, and he was supposed to get back to Chairperson uh, R. Donald Maracle about the next steps, but I, I wasn't, I didn't see anything promising there. I, I thought he was kind of, I don't know. He was, I don't think he cared. He didn't act like he even wanted to be there. He didn't care, act like he cared about our issue. He didn't, 
I thought he was kind of arrogant myself. So the only good thing I could get out of that was, I, like I said, was seeing if we could get Crystal Campbell and Lily to do some kind of information to the community about being able to use this program to fix up their houses and stuff. Or a business, you know, just to help them out with their own hydro bills, even though they got to pay the delivery charge. So come the new year, hydro is supposed to go up quite high. And as you know, um, natural gas is going up as well. So we're going to have some of our community members started to be in real dire straits when it comes to their utilities, because unfortunately these things go up, but the money doesn't go up. So that's my report on that. And we're just waiting to hear back what what's the next step is. I, we haven't heard what the next step is going to be, and it depends on that Minister Smith. I, I'm not holding out any hope for anything. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Helen, for, for bringing uh, your, this report on this topic to Council. Now, just really quickly before I, um, I open up for the question or comment, just wanted to check in with Darren to uh, maybe offer any input uh, on this specific topic from the administrative side. Is there, like, I know there was one, uh, you know, in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, a thorough assessment of all council owned buildings for oh, energy. Yeah. So I wonder if maybe I just want to touch base on that real quick, Darren. Yeah, uh, that's, that's one aspect. I think too, Helen, you raised the issue with, with private ownership too, like our people that own their own homes as well. Yeah. Uh, we had actually through the, again, through the housing need assessment, did some quantification on, on energy, but also an, an inefficiency of homes and then the need to retrofit them as well. So we have a lot yeah. of like evidence around that, but for sure, I mean, I recall the conversation and actually about a year ago, we talked about it again, why was the delivery charge still applicable to, to our buildings? So I think any, any kind of new retrofits or any new kind of new buildings that we do, we're gonna look, be looking at uh, doing the energy uh, audits. I think uh, Crystal's done some of them, but I'm not sure that she's done them all. So I think that's mm -hmm. important that you, you put that in your recommendation to make, that, make sure that that's whole, but also like if there's any sort of retrofitting or especially if prices are going up we need to put in like solar we need to look at other alternatives yeah. for power. so and i know that's also part of lonnie and phil's plan is those solar panels as well with those carbon credits so there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts here but um i think it's time to to start you know pushing this a little, for, a little bit harder he said they had a lot of money yeah because it wasn't it wasn't used very well during covid he said so exactly money there it's a big push right now at, at the government level, the green energy uh, agenda, so. So that's my reports for those three, but I got a, a longer report coming on Monday with the ISC gathering. Okay, Just you. one more thing, Chief, I did share your report, Helen, with, with the, and I know you've reached out to directors, but I've also shared it with uh, our team as well. So everybody's aware. Of, of your recommendations and we're going to help assist with facilitating the work. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Darren. I still have, I have Nathan uh, has his hand raised. Yeah, just really quickly. I think um, by way of the strategy, I think it actually is advantageous to, to continue sitting with uh, the other chiefs, uh, even though they're not pushing <laughs> or pushing where they should be pushing. Um, but I think also we should be ready for, with the information to, to kind of negotiate this on our own if we need to, um, just to be ready for that, because I'm not convinced at the end of the day that um, the, the chief's committee is equipped to do this negotiation. And the other thing is the ministry, the ministry, in, in energy, there's there's a bit of um, uh, a structure to that, <clears throat> and in in fact, you know, the minister has care and control of the legislation, which needs to be amended, but it's actually the OPG that needs to do the work and who we should be negotiating, um, and and then so they're the technicians that work it up, and then the minister it goes into the legislation, so. Strategically, we have an opportunity. We can work with OPG on anything at any point in time, so we should be. 
And then whatever work comes out of that, then we can amend uh, through legislation. If we can convince the other communities to grow a backbone. Yeah, I agree with Nathan. I wouldn't recommend this particular chiefs committee to do any negotiations. I know I wouldn't want to. I, I don't know who they had on their team the first time. I know Ava was on there, but I don't know who else was on that negotiating team. It was me and Ava. That was it. Uh, yeah, today, I don't know. It was a chiefs committee of one. <laughs> And that's what happened last time. So the Chiefs Committee of One did all of the work and we, we got to the negotiations done. And then all these chiefs formed after the deal was done and said, hey, look what we did. And I'm like, we? Oh. <laughs> that was Ava that did it all. So Ava, it was the Chiefs Committee of One. All these other chiefs joined after the deal was done. Yeah, well, I, I know I wouldn't feel comfortable trying to negotiate anything. That would be done. I guess we'll have to discuss that down the road because I I, did, I think I did bring it up. Like, who would be negotiating? I didn't. You know, yeah. R. Donald can. R. Donald's a good man, and, and and I have a lot of respect for him. But he tends to go in all different kind of tangents, <laughs> getting off topic on something else. <laughs> Well, maybe we can have a more focused discussion on, on this particular in, in uh, our upcoming meetings, but I'm just wondering in relation to the recommendation that we should still at least uh, search out uh, this specific program to uh, our community members as well as our council and departments. So I'm wondering maybe if we could still look to a motion on that front. Uh, Helen, is yeah. that? Okay, yeah, so I would want to do that. And 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 uh, Darren, I think Darren uh, responded to that as building assessment because i didn't know we had done one recently right. and I but yeah i would want to to reach out to the community to let to let because crystal knows of another one she told me of another one she thought that's what i was talking about and i said no i'm talking about a different one so there must be another one out there where people can use so we need to let people know if they can do these things get new windows or something i agree and like i said the cdm one is free you don't have to pay it back Okay, so maybe what we can do is just kind of combine the two uh, two together in terms of the information sessions to one council as well as all the departments and any of the both uh, energy saving programs as well as our community members and business community. So that we'll look to, uh, is there a mover and seconder on that motion? Well, I'll move. Moved by Helen, seconder. Second by Audrey. Further questions, comments? Sherilyn. Hi, Sherilyn. I guess the, the thing I'm thinking of, um, again, everything that is being brought up, you know, now and for the, since the past month, can there be a, like a chart with, uh, with them all on it to show that what's going on, where it's at, um, so there can be, so we can always know things like that instead of sitting there thinking in our head where it's at. So I think for, for all of us, I don't know the rest of us, <laughs> but for me, I would like to see that. We just talked about this last week, so that's not actually forthcoming exactly. So it is going? Good. So we'll hopefully awesome. we'll have it ready for next week. Further questions, comments? And sorry to cut you off, Sherilyn. I just want you to know that, yes, exactly what we're saying or you're saying, we're on. So that we can gauge where all this work is. Further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Uh, we can wave second reading on that one. We'll get that happening quite quickly. M motion to wave second reading. Looking to the mover. Second reading. Moved by Helen. Seconder. Second by Audrey. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Okay, thank you so much, Helen, for providing uh, these written and verbal reports uh, to council. Uh, we'll look to further these discussions on housing and ATR specifically on Monday at Political Liaison, and we'll look to the decision points at that time. Okay, Council, I'm going to continue moving down the uh, agenda here under scheduling. We have nothing uh, under that needs a motion. Uh, community safety, we I just made a request to the Anti-Bullying Task Force to provide an update at our next General Council, so that will be forthcoming. 
There was no new business, so that does complete our general counsel for this evening. At this point in time, I'll look to a mover and seconder to adjourn. No more. Moved by Helen, seconder. Second by Greg. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Thank you, Nyama, to everybody for joining us this evening at general counsel. Looking forward to providing further updates on these fronts. Have a great evening.